My dear brethren and sisters, I am grateful for that prayer of President Schutz. I earnestly hope that the petition therein expressed will be answered in our behalf. Recently, I stood in Trafalgar Square in London and looked up at the statue of Lord Nelson. At the base of the column are his words uttered on the morning of the Battle of Trafalgar. England expects that every man will do his duty. On that historic day in 1805, Trafalgar, uh, Nelson was killed as were many others, but England was saved as a nation and Britain became an empire. The image of duty and obedience has been seriously tarnished since that time. It is new exactly. It's as old as human history, that problem. Isaiah declared to ancient Israel, if ye are willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. I recall sitting in this tabernacle when I was 14 or 15, up in the balcony, right behind the clock and hearing President Heber J. Grant tell of his experience in reading the Book of Mormon when he was a boy. He spoke of Nephi and the great influence he had upon his life. And then, with a voice ringing with conviction, which I shall never forget, he quoted those great words of Nephi, I will go and do the thing which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. There came into my young heart on that occasion a resolution to try to do what the Lord has commanded. I would that I might have the power through the Spirit of the Lord so to touch someone in this congregation today. What marvelous things happen when men walk with faith in obedience to that which is required with them. I recently read a very interesting story of Commander William R. Anderson, who took the submarine Nautilus under the polar ice from the Pacific to the Atlantic, a very daring and dangerous thing. It recounted a number of other exploits of similar danger. And then it said that he always carried in his pocket a tattered card which had on it these words, which I commend to you. I believe I am always divinely guided. I believe I will always take the right road. I believe God will always make a way where there is no way. I believe that God will always make a way where there is no way. I believe, my brethren and sisters, that if we will walk in obedience to the commandments of God, if we will follow the counsels of his priesthood, he will open a way even where there appears to be no way. Not far from the Nelson statue in London, is an art gallery in which hangs Sir Joshua Reynolds' painting of the boy Samuel, who as a child heard a voice and replied, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. From that day forward, Samuel walked in obedience to the commandments of God and became the great prophet of Israel. He selected and anointed King Saul and King David. And it was to Saul that he declared a rebuke that has rung down through the centuries. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. I draw strength from a simple statement made concerning the prophet Elijah who warned King Ahab of drought and famine to come upon the land. But Ahab scoffed. 
left, and the Lord told Elijah to go and hide himself by the brook Cherith that he should drink of the brook and that he would fed by the ravens, be fed by the ravens. And the scripture records a simple and wonderful statement. So he went and did according to the work, word of the Lord. There was no arguing, no excusing, no equivocating. Elijah simply went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he was saved from the terrible calamities, calamities that befell those who scoffed and argued and questioned. It is not always easy to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. We may feel inadequate. I frequently draw comfort from the conversation Moses had with Jehovah, who called him to lead Israel out of Egypt. Moses was a fugitive and a herder of sheep. How totally inadequate he must have felt. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And then I can almost hear him say, Please don't ask me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Who hath made man's mouth? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. In 1837, when the church was struggling in Kirtland, Ohio, the prophet Joseph Smith called Heber C. Kimball to go to England to open the work there. Brother Kimball explained in self-humiliation, O oh Lord, I am a man of stammering tongue and altogether unfit for such a work. How can I go to preach in that land which is so famed throughout Christendom for learning, knowledge, and piety? and to a people whose intelligence is proverbial. But then on reflection he added, however, all these considerations did not deter me from the path of duty. The moment I understood the will of my heavenly Father, I felt a determination to go at all hazards, believing that he would support me by his almighty power and endow me with every qualification that I needed. And although my family was dear to me and I should have to leave them almost destitute, I felt that the cause of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, outweighed every other consideration. He traveled over the sea and commenced the work in Lancashire with the very devils of hell opposing him and his companions. And thus began a work in that part of the world which has blessed for good the lives of thousands and hundreds of thousands. The great conference recently held in Mount Manchester was but the lank lengthened shadow of that fearful but faithful beginning. Now, the assignments given us may be distasteful. Naaman the leper came with his horses and with his chariots, with his gifts and his gold to the prophet Elisha to be cured. And Elisha, without so much as seeing him, sent a messenger, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman, the proud, haughty captain of the Syrian host, was insulted at so distasteful a thing and went away. Only when his servants pleaded with him was he humbled enough to return. And the record says, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. <clears throat> there sits in this hall today a man known to many of you. Some years ago, he received a missionary call to the Western States Mission with headquarters in Denver. He'd been to Denver a number of times as a member of the university debate team. It was only over the mountains. He and his parents had dreamed of a more exotic field, of one of those faraway places with the strange-sounding names. His friend smiled. He, those dear to him doubted the wisdom, the inspiration of his call. But he went. He became the counselor to the mission president. 
He was afforded tremendous opportunities for leadership. He met there a beautiful girl whom he later married. And out of the remarkable and peculiar opportunities of that mission there emerged within him qualities which have made him preeminent in his chosen vocation. He sits here today as one of the regional representatives of the Twelve. I think I should add that the man who sits behind me here, President Harold B. Lee, went to the same field under similar circumstances. And out of that obedience came some of those great and marvelous qualities which we have witnessed in his life and for which we so dearly love him. May I share with you something of a personal and sacred testimony? Nearly 40 years ago, I was on a mission in England. I was called to labor in the European Mission Office in London under President Joseph F. Merrill of the Council of the Twelve. One day, three or four of the London papers carried a book review of a reprint of an old book, snide and ugly in tone indicating that it was a history of the Mormons. President Merrill said to me, I want you to go down to the publisher and protest this. I looked at him and was about to say, not me. But I meekly said, yes, sir. I do not hesitate to say that I was frightened. I went to my room and felt something as I think Moses must have felt when the Lord asked him to go see Pharaoh. <clears throat> I offered a prayer. My stomach was churning as I walked over to the Goode Street station to get the underground train to go to Fleet Street. I found the office of the president and presented my card to the receptionist. She took it into the inner office and came back and said, uh, Mr. Skeffington is too busy to see you. I replied that I'd come 5,000 miles and that I'd wait. <laughs> During the next hour, she made two or three trips to his office and then finally invited me in. I shall never forget the picture when I entered. He sat there smoking a long cigar with an expression on his face that seemed to say, don't bother me. I held in my hand the reviews. I do not know what I said after that. Another power seemed to be speaking through me. At first he was defensive and belligerent. Then he began to soften. He concluded by promising to do something within an hour. Word went out to every book dealer in England to return those books to the publisher. At great expense, he printed and tipped in the front of each volume a statement to the effect that the book was not to be considered as history but only as fiction, and that no offense was intended against the respected Mormon people. Years later, he granted another favor of substantial worth to the church. And each Christmas, until he died, I received a card from him. I came to know that when we try to walk in obedience to the counsel of the priesthood placed over us, the Lord opens the way when there appears to be no way. Ten years ago, last Friday, I was sustained in this great tabernacle, a member of the Council of the Twelve. These have been wonderful years fraught with a thousand faith-promoting experiences in many parts of the earth. But of all the experiences I've had, the most rewarding have come in participating in the weekly meetings of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve in the temple which stands to the east of us. Here there is prayer, an earnest pleading for the will of the Lord. And in this sacred place is manifest the spirit of revelation as decisions and programs affecting the Church are proposed and presented. 
Out of the experiences of these 10 years, I give my testimony that God is constantly making known in his way, his will, to his people. I give you my witness that the leaders of this church will never ask us to do anything that we cannot perform with the help of the Lord. We may feel inadequate. That which we are asked to do may not be to our liking or fit in with our ideas. But if we will try with faith and prayer and resolution, we can accomplish it. I give you my testimony that the happiness of the Latter-day Saints, that the peace of the Latter-day Saints, that the progress of the Latter-day Saints, that the prosperity of the Latter-day Saints and the eternal salvation and exaltation of this people lie in walking in obedience to the counsels of the priesthood of God. We thank thee, O God, for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. Help us, O God, to be willing and obedient that we may eat the good of the land. Help us, Father, to place our trust in thee, to go forth with willing, subdued hearts that we may be worthy of thy marvelous blessings. I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.